All right, I think we're going to get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our fifth season of Mary Talks. My name is Jeremy Vaughn. I am the Associate Director of Alumni Programs and Director of Arts Advancement here at Mary Washington. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's talk. We are very excited to host a sizable audience for tonight's presentation, which includes over 700 registrants made up of alumni, students, parents, and friends from 35 different states, and even internationally from as far away as Canberra, Australia, 9,900 miles away, where, and I had to look this up, it is actually 9.30 tomorrow. So those of you watching there, good morning. Um, as with past virtual lectures, there will be time after the talk for our guests to answer any questions you might have. Feel free to ask a question by clicking on the Q&A icon below and submitting there, or vote for other submitted questions to help them rise to the top of the list. At this time, I would like to introduce alumnus Thomas Bowman, class of 2013, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Thomas. Thank you, Jeremy. Stephen J. Farnsworth is Professor of Political Science and International Affairs and Director of the Center for Leadership and Media Studies at the University of Mary Washington. He is the co-author or author of seven books and a 2017 recipient of the Virginia Outstanding Faculty Award from the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia. In addition, Dr. Farnsworth has won three campus-wide teaching awards at Mary Washington the Alumni Association Outstanding Young Faculty Member Award, the Mary W. Pinschmidt Teaching Award, and the Richard Palmieri Outstanding Professor Award. Dr. Farnsworth, who is also Affiliate Faculty in Communication, Digital Studies, and American Studies at UMW, has taught courses in political science, journalism, and political communication at Georgetown University, McGill University, George Mason University, and Methodist College, Kuala Lumpur. Now, Dr. Farnsworth and I connected while I was at the University of Mary Washington, and it's difficult to make personal connections in the COVID era, but one person that students should absolutely go out of their way to get to, get to know is Dr. Farnsworth. I was educated and came out in 2013 into a very tough job market. And Dr. Farnsworth uh, reached out and placed me in an internship where he thought I would excel. Those people ended up running Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden's campaigns at one point or another. And I would not be where I am today in Virginia if we had not built this personal connection. And that is something of value that this college can deliver in any format, digital or in person. And so it is now my honor to present tonight's guest as he presents Late Night Humor in the American Presidency. Dr. Farnsworth, the floor is yours. Welcome to Mary Talks. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's a, a delight to, uh, to be here to talk with everyone and it's great to, to see you and be reminded of just how uh, much uh, success you have had and what you have made of your Mary Washington education. I'm gonna be talking now about uh, my book for a bit and then we'll have an opportunity to have a conversation about some of the issues that I uh, would be glad to uh, answer um, in response to the questions that you offer. But first I wanna offer up a few uh, shout outs. First to my co-author, Bob Lichter at George Mason, who has worked with me on several of my books on media and politics. I also want to uh, have a shout out to some of my current and former students who have helped as research assistants on this project. It is very difficult to uh, imagine uh, the volume of political humor that we've looked at over the years, and it is um, requires a great deal of help from students, and so, uh, I, my thanks to Jeremy Engel, Noah Gardner, and Kate Seltzer of Mary Washington, and um, the people who worked with Dr. Lichter, Farrah Latif, Shailen Petzer, and Deanne Canciello. 
Um, and so all these people were just a wonderful help to this project. And so uh, one of the things, of course, that we can do at Mary Washington is offer opportunities for students to work with professors on their research. And fortunately for me, my current topic of political humor uh, does have a certain level of interest for the students uh, and hopefully for, for you folks here tonight. Um, I, I want to... Um, give you just a general sense about political humor, because although I'm going to talk mostly tonight about uh, recent uh, late night comedy shows and the way in which they've covered recent presidents, it's important to know that political humor is something that has existed across the time of human existence. In, in a way, I think humor offers up an opportunity to cope with life challenges. It's an opportunity perhaps for those people who don't have power to sort of bring down a peg or two the people who do. Um, and if we look across human experience in different cultures, Western and non-Western, we see that political humor has been one of the ways that ordinary people have coped with bad times and bad leaders and the centralization of power uh, that often occurs in political systems. And so you look at the Greeks, you look at the Romans, you look at the Middle Ages, you see over and over again, there is political humor that is part of the way that they coped. It's also true that even in totalitarian societies, there's a lot of political humor. Um, the CIA, one of the things that it did during the days of the Cold War was compile a series of jokes that Russians would tell, only to friends, of course, about Stalin. So even in the worst, darkest days of a totalitarian rule, uh, humor is still part of what is going on. In the United States, of course, we've had a lot of political humor from uh, the very start of our days as an independent republic. Before independence, we were even making jokes about the crown. And then after independence, we started making jokes about our political figures. And that occurs, of course, in ways uh, dependent on the technology of the time. We had uh, Mark Twain, of course, 100 plus years ago, making jokes about uh, the political figures of his day. He was famous for saying that Congress is America's native criminal class. We also had Will Rogers, of course, about 100 years ago. And, um, and then, of course, foreigners, uh, international comics, have also made fun of us as well. So America is an ample supply of humor. And I think we're particularly attuned to political humor in the United States because of our political culture. Remember, we are, uh, at, the, at, it, at our core, a political system that was built by revolutionary figures, people who were very concerned about centralized authority and centralized power. And our revolution, which was a, uh, a revolution against centralized power, and our political system itself were developed in ways to make sure that nobody became too elevated, nobody came became too high. We separate church and state so that the political figures are not uh, religious figures, they're secular figures and they have all those human flaws. We also though, create an environment where uh, our political power is divided, where individual people, be they uh, members of Congress, be they part of the court system, be they part of the executive branch, they only have so much control over political uh, outcomes. And so they have to work together. And we want to build a system as well in our in our founding that the people rule to the maximum extent possible. And so we have our frequent elections and all the other things that we have to keep political figures accountable. So given how interested we are in limited power and limited government, it should come as no surprise that we are focused intensely on bringing those political elites down to size. And nobody's more of a political elite than a president in our political system. Uh, there's an old saying that good comedy punches up and bad comedy punches down. And I think that explains why there is so much attention to the American president in uh, American political humor. Um, Aristotle, uh, who wrote about political humor of uh, more than 2000 years ago, said that humor makes everyone worse than average when they're the subject of, of political comedy. And so that makes sense, I think, from the way in which we cope uh, with difficult environments. 
And uh, to give you an example of how this works, I want to draw your attention back to 9-11. When the terrorist attacks of, of 2001 took place, the comedy shows all went off the air for a while. And one of the first ones back was Saturday Night Live, which was based in New York. And it really is a leading New York City cultural institution, but it's a national cultural institution as well on NBC. And they wanted uh, to be able to create a comedy environment where we can cope with tragedy, because there's also a saying that uh, good comedy is tragedy plus time. And so a part of our healing, I think, was starting to laugh again. And uh, Lauren Michaels of Saturday Night Live uh, asks um, the mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani, who was one of the heroes of, of that moment of 9-11, um, can we be funny again? And Giuliani offers up perhaps the first joke of the post 9-11 environment. And Giuliani says, uh, why start now? And that moment opens up the possibility for even those kinds of topics, uh, something as horrific as 9-11, to be the subject of political humor. And so as we look at this process, we really do see that we're talking about political humor that is designed to, to cope with tragedy. It's designed to uh, offer up some kind of masked, maybe, aggression with respect to political leaders or the people who think that they're better than we are. And that creates a significant uh, way to bring political figures down to size. Because remember, in, uh, in America, that is one of the things that we do. We don't like politicians who think too much of themselves. Now, I have a few slides that I want to show you as part of this conversation to give you a sense of how we built this research project and what we found. Uh, and so I'm going to share the screen here uh, and give you a, um, an opportunity to look at some of the research that, uh, that we've done um, in this project, in this book. Now, one of the things that um, is, uh, is important for us to, uh, to discuss with y'all is the, sent, the, the way that we built this research project. And this was a collaboration between the Center of Media and Public Affairs at George Mason University and the Center for Leadership and Media Studies at Mary Washington, which I direct. And what we did was we looked at all the late night political jokes on the four leading daily comedy programs during the first year of the Trump presidency. We also looked at the comedy during the uh, campaign um, and we used the same shows. Uh, but what we did here was basically focus on the, the network shows. There was Jimmy Kimmel Live, Late Night with Stephen Colbert, uh, and The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Those of course are ABC, uh, CBS, and NBC. And then The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. We looked at all the jokes that they, uh, that they offered up during that time. And we, trying to make this as scientific a study as possible, uh, we looked at the target. We looked at whether there was a policy conversation. We looked at whether the jokes related to personal matters or political matters and so on. But those shows, I think, only tell us part of the story of political humor uh, in contemporary America. And so we also engaged in a qualitative analysis of programs that run once a week. Saturday Night Live, Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, uh, and last week tonight with John Oliver. Um, and so as you look at this, this um, content, the content of, the, uh, of these late night comedies, we're looking primarily, for those of you who know these shows well, we're looking at this in the context of the first 10 minutes or so of the program. Uh, these programs have, uh, particularly with respect to the, uh, the traditional format of um, The Late Show and The Tonight Show, uh, those shows really do have a lot of time spent talking with political figures, talking with guests. And so what we're looking at really is the monologue at the front end. But be that as it may, it's still a huge amount of political humor. We're looking at over 6,000 political jokes during the uh, comedy programs leading uh, during the first year of the Trump presidency. And we looked at, uh, at over 2,300 jokes during the uh, campaign season of 2016, which we'll also talk about uh, as we make our way through the, uh, through the argument. Now, I think what's important to notice above all is the extent to which Donald Trump has become the center of political humor in America. 
if you look at this the slide that I have up now, which looks at the leading targets of late night humor during that first year, you can see how much of it is really connected to Donald Trump. First of all, the overwhelming number of jokes, well, th those were ones directed at Donald Trump. Um, the uh, stories that looked at the Trump administration more generally also rate very high, as do some of the other people in the Trump family or the Trump orbit. Sean Spicer, you may recall, was the first press secretary for President Trump. He got into some trouble almost immediately when he talked about the crowd size being bigger for, uh, for Trump's inauguration than it was for Obama's inauguration, even though pictures make it very clear that the Obama uh, inauguration of 2009 was much, much bigger than the 2017 uh, inauguration of Donald Trump. Uh, and then there was Roy Moore, who was a candidate for the Senate in Alabama. He got into some trouble because of his interest in connecting with young women, uh, particularly sometimes uh, women under the age of 18 during his years as a prosecutor. Uh, Donald Trump Jr., member of the Trump family. Uh, Jeff Sessions was Trump's first attorney general, first lady Melania Trump, Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, the, the, over and over again, the humor is really, really very much directed at members of the Trump administration or the Trump orbit. Um, Anthony Scaramucci was a communications director for President Trump, but he only lasted a few weeks. Uh, he also rounded up the top. Uh, of the uh, the list here, Hillary Clinton is the first Democrat uh, in the uh, in the conversation in terms of the volume of political humor, um, and then uh, a number of other folks connected to uh, the Trump administration, um, and then Vladimir Putin, Barack Obama, uh, and James Comey, the uh, uh, the FBI director um, at the start of Trump's presidency, uh, becomes a major source. So as you look at these voices of political humor. Um, you see a significant orientation towards uh, the Trump presidency and towards Trump personally. Now, part of this, of course, is the nature of news. If you think about what's in the news and what you're going to be talking about as late night comedy that day, it's going to be very presidency focused. In some of my other research, including my, uh, my book, the, uh, the, the Mediated Presidency, also written with Bob Lichter, uh, we looked at the news content and we found that the conversation about Washington is almost entirely presidency focused. So if you look at the evening news or you look at the leading news sites online or offline, uh, the conversation focuses much more on the president and what the president's doing than what's happening in Congress or any other place in Washington. And that creates an environment that uh, I think sets the stage for a presidentially focused conversation about humor. Um, it's also important to recognize that humor has to be, has to have a little bit of familiarity with the subject. And that's one of the key impacts, I think, that, that political humor does have. It can be a vehicle for at least some measure of political learning. Uh, a joke about Republican Senator Mitch McConnell, who's the majority leader in the Senate, is only funny if you know who Mitch McConnell is, and you have some sense of maybe what he looks like or the way that he behaves, because so much of this humor is going to require a certain level of knowledge about the figures. A joke about Vladimir Putin isn't funny if you don't have much of a sense of who Vladimir Putin is. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about comparisons here. Um, in the book, I go into the differences among the individual late night shows and how they approach things a bit differently. The one main distinction that I would draw, I'm not going to give you a slide with a lot of data on it, but the one main distinction I would draw is uh, that Jimmy Fallon is a bit less critical. Um, if you think about Stephen Colbert, for example, uh, Stephen Colbert, much, much more critical than, uh, than uh, some of the other late night comics. And, uh, and uh, Jimmy Fallon in particular has gotten into some, uh, some trouble with respect to the way that he treated President Trump. Uh, you may recall President Trump was a celebrity on NBC, The Apprentice, and The Celebrity Apprentice before he became a presidential candidate. And he did appear on The Fallon Show before he was president. And during that uh, campaign appearance, because it was little more than that, um, Jimmy Fallon sort of playfully uh, rubbed Trump's hair. The question was, is Trump's hair real? And the uh, this sort of friendly bantering interview uh, with uh, Jimmy Fallon and Donald Trump uh, really had an impact on his ratings. Um, if you think about the folks who are watching late night comedy, they tend to be a bit younger and younger voters tend to skew more democratic than older voters. 
And so there was a significant impact in ratings. After that incident, Jimmy Fallon uh, lost out as the top rated late night show to the Stephen Colbert show and has struggled to catch up with Colbert uh, ever since. Now, when you look at how presidential candidate Donald Trump is treated compared to uh, previous presidents, you really do see a very powerful difference here. Uh, I, if you, uh, you know, once upon a time when you thought about late night comedy, you thought no president would ever be the subject of more jokes than Bill Clinton. He was an aging Lothario who was particularly uh, a target of late night comedy during the 1990s, the Clinton Lewinsky scandal, uh, Bill Clinton's sometimes inconsistent statements relating to, to, to Vietnam or his inconsistent behavior in some other areas uh, lends itself to comedy. I think the more seriously you take you yourself as a political figure, the riper a target you are for comedy, uh, particularly as a president or presidential candidate. Um, and so if you look at the, uh, the number of jokes told by during the campaign season about presidents and presidential candidates, you really do see uh, that Donald Trump stands alone. In 2017, 3,100 jokes about Donald Trump, the president, that's far, far more than any other president. Eight years earlier, Barack Obama, his first year as president, 936 jokes about him. Um, if you look at Donald Trump, the candidate, 1,800 jokes about him during the 2016 campaign. Now that's more than three times the number of jokes told about Hillary Clinton, the Democratic nominee that year, um, but also far more than previous candidates. John McCain, uh, who ranked uh, second uh, in terms of presidential candidates and the humor directed at them, uh, 1,358 jokes during the campaign season of 2008. Uh, when you look at um, the uh, dynamic here, uh, you can see that, um, that the, uh, the rankings increase generally with time. And I think that has to do with sort of larger issues about our political moment and our political environment. Um, there's a market for political humor and that market has been growing. There is more and more interest in these comedy shows and more and more interest in the comedy shows in taking uh, attacks or taking, uh, making light of political figures. Um, it isn't just the shows that air at 11.30 that we're talking about here, because one of the things that you'll notice in our modern environment is these things get shared peer to peer, uh, if you look at YouTube, if you look at Instagram and Facebook, these clips make their way throughout the universe of social media. And so the impact that they have is even greater, I would argue, than uh, was the case when we were looking just primarily at who was tuning in at that hour and the jokes and the impacts that they might have that, that night. And then perhaps the next day as people talked over the water cooler or uh, over the lunch table about what was the last thing that was said on uh, Johnny Carson or Jay Leno. Uh, I think that this is one of the reasons why um, we see so much more focus on political humor now. I think that the environment is more partisan and coarser than it was historically. And so the, uh, the last several years, I think, have, have really created an opportunity for a, a much more vicious mockery than you saw in the past, but also a much higher volume of it. Um, I also think that, that, that Donald Trump creates lots of opportunities for uh, political humor. Um, it, it, compare uh, Barack Obama to Donald Trump for a moment. Uh, what, what Barack Obama tried to do in his connection with political humor was try to connect with the hosts. I mean, one of the tricks of successful management of political humor when you're a political figure is to kind of go along with a joke or at least show that you have a sense of humor. Uh, once upon a time, back in World War II, uh, there was FDR, President Roosevelt, and his dog Fala. And that dog was left behind on a military trip to Alaska. And when FDR uh, found out that the, the dog had been left behind, or the people realized that the presidential dog had been left behind, uh, they sent a ship to collect the dog. And uh, FDR made a joke about how the dog was really upset about the, uh, about the whole business of being left behind. And so this, this could have been a, a moment of sort of wasteful spending during the wartime, 
But instead, FDR turned it into a joke about a, an angry Scots Terrier, uh, upset about the amount of money that was being spent to recover the dog, and upset about not being central enough uh, in uh, FDR's calculations that the dog ended up left behind in the first place. Um, similarly, when Ronald Reagan uh, once gave a speech and dropped all of his papers on the uh, on the ground, he scooped them all up and he said, well, it doesn't really matter uh, what order they're in anyway. Um, only 10 seconds of this is going to be on TV. And when he makes a joke like that, um, you really sort of humanize the person. And so instead of making a, um, a joke about, uh, about Ronald Reagan and maybe not being as organized as he might have been, uh, he, uh, along with uh, FDR before him, uh, created an opportunity to laugh at oneself and this is one of the things that I think makes a successful management of political humor by a president. So now getting back to Barack Obama. Uh, Barack Obama had a key policy issue that he focused on during his years as president, and that was trying to increase the enrollment of uh, people getting health care in America. This was the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, but it was also a question of getting people to enroll. And one of the things that Barack Obama did was to go on a show called Between Two Ferns, starring Zach Galifianakis. And on that show, he basically traded jokes with Zach Galifianakis. It's a, it's a clip worth looking up on YouTube if you haven't seen it yet. But what happens there is Barack Obama talks about how um, Zach Galifianakis was lucky that he had bigger stars to, uh, to save the, uh, the movies, um, the hangover movies that Zach Galifianakis was involved in, and so on. But in the end, uh, Barack Obama had an opportunity to pitch the Affordable Care Act and enrollment, particularly young people getting enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. And the numbers of enrollment actually went up afterwards. But what you saw with Barack Obama was that he could take a joke and that he could give as well as he got with respect to humor. He also, um, in one of the most famous clips involving Barack Obama and Donald Trump, uh, Barack Obama savaged Donald Trump uh, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner during the Trump, uh, the Obama presidency, when he said that that Donald Trump uh, uh, was really sort of handling serious policy issues, like uh, which uh, chef uh, should be fired at the uh, at the Trump uh, resort. So there were all these things going on um, that uh, that really made Barack Obama uh, somebody who was a tough target to hit, if you will, uh, when it came to political humor. Uh, Donald Trump, though, is very different. First of all, Donald Trump gets into lots of fights with these late night comics. He doesn't like the way Stephen Colbert treats him. He doesn't like, uh, in particular, the way Alec Baldwin uh, impersonates him on Saturday Night Live. And when Trump insults Alec Baldwin, saying that he's a has-been actor and that this, this imitation is not an effective one, um, why that's good for Saturday Night Live because it draws more attention to Saturday Night Live, but it's also good for Donald Trump because one of the ways that he has maintained his support among his supporters is by attacking the media. And in some ways, late night comedy is media and, some, and in some ways it's not. They're certainly not required to be objective. These are for-profit commercial co operations, these late night shows. And if they're not providing a product that people want, it won't be good for business and it won't be profitable. So they're not subject to the kind of objectivity or professional standards of news. Uh, they, in fact, late night comedy takes things a bit further perhaps than reality might consider appropriate or fair, but they're not about being fair, they're about being funny. Now, um, another thing of course with Donald Trump is the extent to which he's, um, he's very, very angry and frustrated in public. And he really does say things that are inconsistent with things that he said in the past. And those kinds of discrepancies is where humor lies, according to Stephen Colbert. Colbert says that the reason he talks so much about Donald Trump is because that there's a big gap between what Donald Trump says at one time and says at another time, or between what Donald Trump says and what the factual reality might be. Now, I don't know what late night comedy is going to do when uh, a year from now or five years from now, Donald Trump is no longer president, but the reality is that for the moment, this has, Donald Trump has been very, very good for business. Now, there is a significant disparity um, between the way that candidates are treated. Um, as you look at the uh, Democratic and Republican candidates, these are election uh, year comedy discussions. And so over and over again, you see that there is more humor directed at the Republicans marked here on the red line than the Democrats uh, marked on the blue. 
this uh, this uh, is an argument that we discussed in a monkey cage uh, opinion column in the Washington Post as well as in the book. But what you see here is that there has been a steady advantage or disadvantage, if you prefer, in terms of the late night comics saying more about Republican candidates for president than Democratic ones. It's true if there's a Republican incumbent president. It's true if there's a Democratic incumbent president. It's true if neither candidate for the presidency is currently in office. But what you can also see as you look at these trends going back to 1992 and going through 2016 is a significantly widening gap over time. Now that was particularly pronounced in 2016 compared to four years earlier. But if you look across the trend going back to 1992, you see a very distinct increase um, in that gap between the way that Republican candidates have been treated and the way that Democratic candidates have been treated. And again, you might look at this in the context of the issues of partisan bias, but I think that kind of misses the point because ultimately what's going on here is a business model that is very, very focused on the bottom line. I think certain kinds of media or entertainment news or entertainment media, whatever term you prefer, uh, lend themselves to more effective targets. Uh, the iconoclastic nature of late night comedy may lend itself to uh, the, more, uh, the, the more democratic sensibilities. Uh, it's important to note that late night comedy has not been successful when offered up by Republicans. Fox News tried to do its own version of The Daily Show, and it had one of the worst audience shares in the history of political humor, and it was canceled after um, a few months. Um, but at the same time that Democrats seem to be more uh, interested in late night comedy, Republicans are much more effective, conservative voices are much more effective on talk radio. I think that uh, the different medium suggests different kinds of dynamics. And I do think that, uh, that for, uh, for uh, as we look at these things, um, again, because of, um, of the focus on uh, our talk today, I'm talking primarily about political humor as that relates to late night comedy. But certainly if you compare across the range of news and information sources, you see that some things work better than others. The, the Democrats have tried to create uh, a liberal talk radio, but it has never had the audience that conservative talk radio has. And the ratings for MSNBC generally do not compare to the high ratings uh, that you see on Fox News uh, when it comes to that conversation. But it may be that the uh, different temperaments of different kinds of elements of the electorate uh, may lend itself more to one format or another. I think that the, uh, that the anger that you can hear on some talk radio programs wouldn't necessarily translate well to uh, political humor and the content that kind of mocking iconoclastic nature of political humor I don't think would lend itself all that well to uh, to talk radio either. Now I want to uh, give you a sense of how uh, this contrast uh, works over time by taking an, an, a two-minute clip from Johnny Carson, who was one of the dominant voices of late night comedy for a generation. Uh, if you look at what Carson said in this clip that I'm about to show you from 1989 and his comments about Ronald Reagan, you can see how far we've changed. Um, I'm not gonna show you a clip from uh, 2019 or 2020. Uh, you've seen those or you can see them very easily, but compare the harshness of late night comedy that you see today with the harshness or the lack of harshness more precisely with the Johnny Carson oriented humor looking at Ronald Reagan. So, um, and so think about that as we, um, as we open it up for after that for questions. But I have one other point to make before we show, I show you that clip. And, uh, and it, return, it returns us back to this issue of uh, good comedy punching up and bad comedy punching down. Um, and that may explain one of the reasons why conservative humor hasn't been so successful. Um, I suppose you could make a joke about immigrants or people who are homeless on late night TV, um, but I don't know that there would be an audience for that because they, these are not 
necessarily groups that have that kind of power and authority that allow, allows for mockery to be seen in good taste. But the question that I leave you with before we get to the Carson clip is who exactly determines where up and down is? Um, if you look at the uh, I, these comedy shows, these are not comedy shows that are really as reflective of sort of the Midwest, the American middle, uh, as was the case in Carson's era. You have uh, shows that are produced on the coasts for a coastally oriented audience, for a culturally oriented audience that may come up with a very different point of view. Um, if you are not a Trump supporter, I would encourage you to watch late night comedy with the thought that how would a Trump supporter look at this humor, so much of it focused on the president? How would that be uh, received? And then you might think again about this idea of good comedy uh, punching uh, up. Um, from the point of view of say, uh, a working class white industrial worker in the Midwest or a farmer um, in the Midwest, and they're looking at these uh, attacks on the president that they support, uh, they might look at this and say, this is simply not uh, people punching up at people in power, but what they are are coastal elites punching down at people like me, people who believe in what I believe. And so I think one of the things to think about in terms of the future of political humor is this question about where um, you can connect with uh, the wider range of voters in this country, the wider range of potential viewers of these shows. Because uh, right now, when you do public opinion surveys of people who watch late night, we see that the audience does skew to the more democratic side. It also skews to uh, the younger uh, audience under 30s. And it also skews towards the, uh, the audience in, uh, in, on the East Coast and the West Coast. So there are those dynamics. But now uh, allow me to take a moment here to, uh, to reset the, uh, the screen here for um, a, um, a look at the, uh, at the Johnny Carson clip. And then after that, I will open it up for questions. Watching the news just a moment ago, the perfectly good president. Did I watching the news just a moment ago? Apparently, the president and Mrs. Reagan are out here in California, even though he does not officially leave office till the 20th of January. And they're a new, they're a new home in Bel Air. They had an awkward moment today. The little old lady from the welcome wagon showed up, <laughs> and six Secret Service agents wrestled her to the ground <laughs> and stomped on her angel food cake. <laughs> he lives in a nice. A certain advantage to be an ex-president, you know. His gardener has a stealth leaf blower. <laughs> so Reagan can sleep late. I can't just uh, They asked the president what he's going to do. He said he's going to write his new office building in Century City, and he's going to write his memoirs. Now, that's fascinating. For the last two years, he's telling us he can't remember a thing. <laughs> It's funny how a big cash advance from Random House can jog a politician's memory. Well, yes, I do remember that now, yes. It'd probably be a nice book. Riggers are having dinner tonight with guess who? Ooh. Merv Griffin. Ooh. I guess Merv is finally rich enough to qualify as a friend of the Reagans. <laughs> Do you see Reagan at Mervyn dinner? Well, that should be a wonderful conversation. Well, ooh. Well, ooh. <laughs> All night long, well, 
Ooh. Yeah. I, uh, I'll be honest with you, I didn't get an invitation to, to dine with the president, but I'll be at Jack in the Box having finger food with Dan Quayle. <laughs> I'm asking you to make a donation right now to have your gift. And so what you see here with this conversation is an extraordinary sense of the gentle way in which a generation ago, political humor treated political figures. And that is such a sharp contrast to the really scorched earth political humor that you see today. Um, now, again, I do not blame the comics for this. I think really what we're talking about here is a response to the market. Um, American political culture has coarsened. American politics has coarsened. Why would we expect anything different from American public humor that is reflecting what we, the people, and we, the audience, are looking for. Uh, with that, I will hand it back to uh, Jeremy to offer up some questions for us. Yeah, we have a good number of questions here. So we're going to start at the top. Matthew Baker asks, President Trump embraces some humor that targets him. He was on the Comedy Central roast, hosting SNL where he was made fun of. He rails against most others. Is there a rhyme or reason? What's the difference between helpful and harmful comedy from the target's perspective? Well, uh, the examples that you mention occur before Trump ran for president. And so I think it's important to recognize that uh, a person who is on their way up is in a very different position than somebody who actually has, uh, cam is campaigning for president or actually is president. Um, he, yes, indeed he was. He was a target of Saturday Night Live repeatedly. He hosted Saturday Night Live. And, uh, and he was treated uh, a re as a regular uh, guest on these comedy shows during the 80s and the 90s when he was a real estate developer who was trying to sell products besides Donald Trump. He was trying to sell Donald Trump casinos. He was trying to sell Donald Trump University, trying to sell Donald Trump steaks, and of course, Donald Trump uh, resorts, golf courses, and wineries. And so you can see why he would say all publicity is good publicity when I have Trump products to sell. But when you're in political, in the political environment uh, as a presidential candidate or a president, and you're as thin-skinned as Donald Trump, I don't think that it works particularly well. Um, you see a lot of political figures, I think, who can make some level of uh, joke about themselves. And I used FDR and Reagan as an example. John F. Kennedy was another one that way. I mean, even Abraham Lincoln made jokes about how he was kind of ugly. Um, in, uh, in the middle of the Civil War as a way to lighten the mood. So there clearly is a, a way in which you can do this effectively. And I think Barack Obama uh, was one of the presidents that we can point to in the very recent argument era that, that was pretty good at this. I think that, uh, that sometimes the temperament of a president just doesn't lend itself to humor the same way. I think um, if I were to pick two presidents who were particularly not good at this, um, it would be Donald Trump and Bill Clinton. Uh, they both, I think, were really kind of thin-skinned where their personal life was concerned, and they certainly uh, were not willing to uh, engage in the friendly uh, comic banter that, uh, that lends itself to positive treatment. Remember, when you're running for president, these are shows that have a lot of people who might not think that much about politics. And so during the last year or so, we have seen one Democratic candidate after another uh, on Colbert and on Kimmel and, and on Fallon. It's a chance to be heard in a national audience and particularly an audience that doesn't have a lot to say about politics. And so that is a vehicle for being, uh, for being heard. But I think that Trump has come to the conclusion that most of his supporters are not really going to be reached this way, that he's more effective connecting with Fox News, calling into the talk shows and, uh, and chatting up the hosts of, of Hannity and, and other shows on Fox. Okay. Ralph Beidelman asks, why aren't there many right-leaning late comedians? Well, I do think that it has to do with the issues that I've raised in the, uh, in the conversation that we've been having here, that you just quite simply find uh, that there isn't an audience for it. Um, now, I suppose uh, one answer is that, uh, that the, uh, the audience skews younger and the college age young adult audience 
doesn't have as many conservatives in it as, say, an older crowd. Uh, it may be that we think about the time that these things air and the extent to which people who are, let's say they're working shifts in the factories, they're not going to necessarily be up at midnight uh, hearing the latest from uh, Stephen Colbert, even if they were interested. Now, you catch that stuff the next day, sure, but, uh, but that might be another issue. The third issue, I think, does have to do with the nature of, of comedy. It, to the extent that conservatism is about protecting um, establishment values and establishment culture, you know, people who mock those things are not going to be well received. I mean, y- you can make jokes about religion if you're not religious, right? I mean, it becomes much more problematic if you're really a, an intensely evangelical Christian oriented person to make jokes about that religion. If you're not religious, then you can be more iconoclastic. And I think that conservatives with their uh, tendency or temptation to support order and authority more than say liberals do, that creates another a barrier to successful comedy. But one of the ways to, 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 to do this is to look for yourself. Go back and look at the Fox News efforts at humor and see whether you think they're funny and see whether you think there should have been a market for it because there certainly wasn't. I really like this next question. I suspect it's from an alum close to my age based on the examples that they list. They say, I would suspect some people use these shows, especially ones like John Oliver's and John Stewart's Daily Show as a source of news as much as it is a source of comedy. And he comments there, is that a dangerous reality? Well, you know, I, I sometimes think that late night comedy might offer up that sort of the old phrase, the spoonful of sugar helping the medicine go down. Um, if you get a If you get a joke about Mitch McConnell, for example, and you don't really understand who Mitch McConnell is or what he stands for, why then maybe you learn a little bit about politics. I mean, a joke about a Supreme Court appointment or a joke about uh, healthcare. I mean, those things are only funny in the context of how much you already know about these things. And so I do think, and this is one of the things that we see in public opinion data, is that the people who watch these shows do find themselves consuming more news because they want to make sense of the jokes and they want to be prepared for the jokes as they come along. So there is that that's going on. But there's another thing too. Um, And uh, although we haven't talked too much about John Oliver's show yet, uh, he does something very different for people who are not familiar with it. He has the equivalent of a deep dive, 15 minutes or so sometimes, on individual stories that might not lend themselves to the sort of one-liner, quick snap judgment joke of a monologue. I mean, if you spend 20 minutes talking about campaign finance laws, or you spend 20 minutes about mail-in ballots, or any of these kinds of issues with respect to health care provision, or money in politics, and the things that he looks at. Now, you might wonder how you can make this funny, but he finds a way. Um, and that is an extraordinary uh, talent. But it's also an extraordinary ability, because one of the things that I notice as a professor sometimes is that my s- students sometimes struggle to get through some of the material that they need to read to understand the public policy issues of the day. And what Oliver can do is offer up to an audience, a significant audience, mind you, uh, a chance to really look in on, focus on an issue and present um, an opportunity to to give us a lighter interpretation on the news, but a very informative one too. I mean, I, I would not encourage anyone to rely entirely on for their news on late night comedy. That would be a distorted funhouse mirror vision of the world. But it does make sense, I think, to appreciate it for what it is. And that could be sort of a leading news consumption indicator uh, that would draw more people into understanding more about what's going on in this country. Here's another question that asks some specific examples. To what degree do you feel that comedian Sarah Cooper's lip syncing of President Trump Saturday Night Live's lampoons of some of the presidential's mannerisms and behavior, as well as Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, and Jimmy Kimmel's focusing on the Trump's mendacity, gaslighting, and culture war stances will influence voters? Or should we assume that these audiences already will not vote for the president's reelection? Yeah, I, I, I sometimes wonder what these comedy shows offer to people who do support the president. I think that the you know, the occasional joke about Bernie Sanders is really not going to cut it to make a Trump supporter feel good about what is the Gatling gun approach of late night comedies that deals with the Trump presidency. So I do think that there is a 
a, a dynamic, and we're seeing that in uh, public opinion surveys of who watches these shows, that conservatives are a little less interested, that they spend a little less time with these shows than, uh, than liberals do. And so I do think that there is a, uh, a dynamic here that offers up a, 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 an audience that is not fully representative of the American electorate. But I think that's probably true for just about anything. I mean, if we talked about Big Ten football on Saturday afternoons, which is about to get started again, that audience is not representative either. Um, if we think about the people who are watching uh, opera on PBS, that's not an audience that's representative. I mean, you know, entertainment television is never going to appeal to any everyone. And so there is a dynamic. But getting to the question, the point about does this change the electorate, I don't think that it really does. I think that we're looking at an electorate that is largely frozen in place. If you look at Trump's approval rating, for example, across the four years of his presidency, it's pretty consistently been low to mid 40s, never really much lower than that and never really much higher than that. And so it doesn't matter. You, you meet with the leader of North Korea, the approval numbers don't change. Unemployment goes down, uh, approval numbers don't change. COVID happens, uh, approval numbers don't change. The economy shuts it down. The stock market goes up and down. Approval numbers don't change for Donald Trump. And so I think that we're really looking at a situation in this country right now where Trump's support is ironclad and there's nothing much that the comedy uh, content is going to impact. And I think that the people who dislike Trump in the same way that the people who uh, like Trump are kind of frozen in their position, that's also true. And so if there's an electorate in the middle, the sort of middle that we talk about, uh, ideologically centrist, moderate, um, I'm not sure that there's more than a sliver of this country that is in that position. And I'm not sure that those people who, after four years of the Trump presidency, have not decided whether they like it or not, I'm not sure that there are that many people in that position who are going to be all that excited about voting. If you, uh, you know, you're talking about low information voters, potentially, in the ideological middle, uh, and low passion voters. And those are not vehicles for maximizing voter turnout. A question from Sarah. Fascinating talk. Thank you. Not a question, more of a wonder. Which political movements or changes started as a joke? What are some of the most politically powerful jokes ever told in a good way? That's a big question. <laughs> that is a big question. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, that I would draw your attention to is, you know, I mentioned it briefly in the, the conversation, but uh, the, the the joke attributed to Abraham Lincoln, and you know, he was he was he was he was called two faced, and the joke attributed to him was, if I was really two faced, would I be using this one, which. You know, I think speaks to the humility of politics. I think that politicians who, you know, try to remind people that we are a republic, that that the that presidents and other political leaders come and go, and that we are, you know, we are not looking at people who are deities, who are not, they are not gods, and they are ordinary people. You know, mm -hmm. uh, John F. Kennedy, you know, also you know, would, would make would make jokes, you know. Uh, Ronald Reagan, um, I think, though, is probably the, the, the sort of standard bearer. Um, he's famous for saying, um, there's a saying that hard work never killed anybody, but I always say, why take a chance? <laughs> and so the idea that presidents are ordinary people like us that can make jokes about their own sort of narrative, because one of the narratives about Ronald Reagan was that he, he was not particularly engaged as president. And so, you know, when you can make jokes like this about yourself, you send a very, very effective message. Um, Donald Trump doesn't even try, I don't think, to do this. Remember, he's not willing to appear at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, where so many presidential self-deprecating comments have been made over the years. And he's not willing to engage in anything other than a back and forth of insults with, uh, with Saturday Night Live in terms of the way that he's treated there. So I do think that is a, a dynamic that is really, really important in our political system. It's important that politicians do not think too highly of themselves. And it's also important that we do not think too highly of them. And so I think the most effective political humor is not told by the late night comics actually, but by the presidents themselves who are reminding everyone, as well as themselves, that this is fleeting. We have time for just a few more questions. Uh, the next question, thank you for this lecture. 
You mentioned that students assisted with your research. Considering the pandemic and other challenges facing Mary Washington, is there anything that we can do to help students and faculty? Yeah, I, I think it's important to recognize that this is a very difficult time for higher education. Um, at Mary Washington, we've struggled to try to create a safe environment for students. But the reality is that the university is facing financial pressures as uh, a result of the increased costs of trying to create a safe environment, the increasing resources that we need to make everything work effectively for the students. And so there have been cutbacks in various programs, including uh, programs that assist students. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things to uh, remember for those uh, people who are beyond the college age years is how difficult it is for students to have uh, the money that they need to maximize the experience. Um, I, uh, one of the programs that the university offers, because of course Mary Washington is close to Washington DC in Northern Virginia, is a fund, a fund that allows for scholarship money to be used to help students with study abroad, with internships in DC. And I, I'm thinking of a student of mine from a couple of years ago who uh, got an internship with Congressman Rob Whitman, but didn't really have the money to pay for the Virginia Railway Express, the commuter train in the Fredericksburg area, trip up to Capitol Hill. And so he was able to get a grant from the university to finance that program. And that was really a life-changing experience for this student. He um, was um, head of the College Republicans. He was very interested in partisan politics, very interested in politics. And he was able to use that internship experience to work on campaigns and even get himself a job on Capitol Hill working permanently for a Republican member of Congress. And so these are the kinds of things where really even small resources can have huge impacts because our students uh, are generally middle-class students or sometimes working-class students who are often uh, struggling with the challenges of financing the education, but also taking advantage of those additional things that the university can offer. And in these tough times, the university is struggling sometimes to come up with the resources to fund student undergraduate research. Um, one other thing I might mention, one of my uh, proudest days as a uh, professor over the last couple of years was a national research conference at Pi Sigma Alpha, the Political Science Honor Society. We had five Mary Washington students, the most we've ever had presented this national undergraduate research conference in Washington. It was held at George Washington University and they all had the chance to present their honors projects. And so the, the funds for the university also paid for their, their trip up there. And it was a weekend conference. So they also stayed in, in a hotel and interacted with uh, policymakers in Washington. We were able to set up some events for them uh, beyond the research conference itself. And so it was a wonderful experience for those students. And you know those sorts of things uh, really can transform an experience for a student. And I, I, one of the things I worry about is the extent to which um, those sort of programs might be um, under more financial pressure in this difficult economic time. Uh, we're a public university, but the state support for higher ed has been cut significantly. Um, and, uh, and donors who might think we're doing okay, well, we could be doing better, particularly where some of these programs are concerned. Steve, I hope you don't mind. I found the link to that and put that up as a chat box if anybody wants to learn more about that endowment. That's, that's a wonderful source. So there it is. We probably have time just to get to one more, and it's another student-focused question. Would you say the polarization of political opinions among students is on par with previous years, or is it at all different? Well, I, I do think that to today's students, and I'm talking primarily about political science majors because the students that I see are almost entirely political science majors or students with a high level of interest in political science. They might be majors or they might be majors in a related field that just that's interested in, uh, in the courses that I offer. And what we do see is that the students are actually um, more um, polarized than mm -hmm. They, uh, than they have been across the 20 some years that I've been uh, teaching at Mary Washington and elsewhere. And I think that that has to do with the fact that uh, they're getting the wrong lessons from cable TV. Uh, cable television talk shows often uh, involve really aggressive uh, shouting matches and really combative conversations between left and right. And so they're not really about generating light or insight, they're more about generating heat. 
And that makes sense, I suppose, for the audience. They want to have high ratings. And if people are screaming at each other, I guess that works as a business model. It doesn't work as an education model, though. And I think that um, that one of the things that I try to cultivate in my classes and my students is to try to get them to go beyond sort of talking points and listen to each other. I mean, what is the argument you would make if you believed this? And have them look at those kind of questions. It's one of the big challenges I often uh, ask my students to do. If you wanted to, you know, make the case for such and such an outcome, regardless of what you personally believe, how would you make it? What would be the best things you could say? And that, and that they get to listen to each other. And it, it opens up the conversation in a, in a more effective way because really if I'm just going to be the moderator of Crossfire in the classes, I don't think the students are gonna learn much. And I really try to avoid that at all, as at all possible. And, and over the course of the semester, I think a lot of students get that. I think that's one of the advantages, by the way, of Mary Washington. We're small enough that if you started screaming at each other, you would have um, some sort of backlash in terms of your personal life. You, you can't just retreat in the anonymous, anonymity of, a, of, oh, I don't know, K Street, D.C. You know, you'd see these people at the dining hall. You'd see them at the gym. You'd see them uh, in Monroe Hall over and over again. And so, so I do think that, um, that the students are generally quite receptive to the idea that, you know, we're not trying to imitate uh, the late night comment, the late night political crossfire shows that you see on cable. Thank you, Dr. Farnsworth, for joining us this evening. We're out of time. I'd also like to thank Mark Simpkins from Events AV who helped facilitate the virtual logistics of tonight's program. And thanks again to all of our viewers at home for joining us tonight and being a part of the conversation. As a quick reminder, this presentation will be available for viewing on the UMW YouTube channel starting tomorrow. There you can watch this program and browse the full catalog of Mary Talks. And our fifth season of Mary Talks continues on October 14th with doctors Miriam Liss and Holly Schifrin, who will present Let's Get Happy, The Science of Positive Psychology. We look forward to seeing you then, if not earlier. Thank you and good night. <laughs>